Is anyone excited to be here today? Yeah, come on, I'm excited to be here. Man, the church, the place where we come and we gather, we recharge, right? We refuel. And uh, hey, if this is your first time today, we just, we hope it's not your last time. We hope it's not your last Sunday. And uh, thanks for taking a risk to try something new. And we have this little challenge, we call it, it's called the three-week challenge. And that's just to challenge you to come on back over the next three weeks. Try to this to let it be a weekly rhythm in your life because we truly believe that if you allow it, uh, that it'll bring great purpose and value to your life. And so we're so glad that you're here as we continue in our our series called Run, and we're going through the story of Moses. And I just want to kick it off by just by raise of hands, okay? When it comes to running, and I mean like jogging running, who likes to jog? Who likes to run? Come on, raise them up. Yeah. Okay, everyone else who has their hands down, I'm with you, okay? It's like I'm more of like a rollerblader, okay? Don't judge me. Or like a title boxer. I like to box. And, you know, I'm like Rocky in the ring over there sometimes. And actually, no, I'm like more of like a comedy show. The trainers are are like, why does this guy keep coming back for more? He's just like, what's wrong with him? But hey, I still go. And so when it comes to running, I know I need to run and, you know, treadmill or outside. And man, the excuses that just pile up time and time and time when it comes to running. I don't know if you can relate. It's like, well, I just ate. So I probably shouldn't run now, or, or maybe I'm in the office and it's like, well, if I just, another hour I could get ahead or get caught up, you know, so I'll just, I'll say no to the gym or, or I hit the snooze button or have you ever done this? You've ever been guilty of this where, where you, where you're driving into the gym and as you drive into the gym, uh, you get a phone call and as you get a phone call, you're like, do I accept it or decline? So you're in the parking lot and you accept it. You take the call then you're done with the call and you just drive right off. I mean, you made it, right? I don't know if it counts. I mean, you're in the parking lot. Guilty, guilty. It's happened to me way too many, way too many times. And so uh, what we're talking about today is we're talking about excuses, but not, not excuses of just physically running, but excuses that we, that we make when it comes to our calling. Here's a question for you, okay? What excuses are you using to run from your calling? We're talking about in this series of what are we running away from or what are we running to. So what excuses are you using to run from your calling? Now you might be thinking, well, I don't have a calling. Yeah, you do. You got a calling. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. Stop arguing with me. You got a calling. You truly have a calling, I'm telling you. And why do I know this? Why do I know that you have a calling? Okay, I want everyone to just kind of take a deep breath with me. Come on. Let it out. One more time. Let it out. You feel that? That means you're alive. And if you're alive, that means you have a purpose. That means you have a plan. That means that God has a calling for your life, just specifically for you. Now you might be asking, well, what's my calling, Travis? Well, I'm glad you asked. You guys are excited today. This is good. I'm glad you asked. Now, here, here's, here's what I'm going to share with you. Uh, one of my, my life verses, my, my, a portion of scripture that has helped guide and shape me in my life to step into the callings of my life was written by a king named David in the book of Psalms. And he says this. He says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The idea that if you strive after him, if you strive after delighting in him, that those dreams, that those purposes, that those callings that are inside of you stirring, they're not there by accident. They're there for a reason. And God is the one who's given you your creativity. God is the one that has given you your imagination. And he's the one that stirs that in there. And so this idea, say this with me, say this with me. Let's go into the next one. Uh, Let's all together. When you delight in him, your desires become more like him with a little more emphasis. Come on, help me out. When you delight in him, your desires become more like him. That is the truth. The more that we strive after him, the more our desires become more like him. And those desires and those purposes and those dreams, these callings, they come up in different forms. Maybe it's the calling for you that, 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 that you want to be a great parent or a grandparent to invest in the next generation to show kids how much God loves them and has designed them and how much value they have. Maybe it's a calling that you want to have a, a marriage that is a modeling marriage that, 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 that people want to emulate. Maybe it's a specific calling in, in your mind that, that you have this thing that you need to create or with your hands 
things that you're supposed to create with this skill uh, to make a dent in the world, or, or God has given you a calling to help other people. And for those of you that have put your faith in Jesus, you have an automatic calling, because, because when you were changed, when God saved you, when he gave you new life and hope, he automatically gives us the calling that we can't keep it to ourselves, that we have to tell the people around us one person at a time. We all have different callings, but come on, right? If you're like me, how easy is it for us to talk ourselves out of our callings, right? How easy is it for you, for me, to talk ourselves out of our callings? Excuses after excuses after excuses after excuses. Now we're talking about Moses. So Moses, right, he was an extraordinary person. I mean, did crazy things. I mean, he's the one that, 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 that led the people out of, out of Egypt. He, he, he's the one that, that God used to part the Red Sea. He's the one that, that God gave the Ten Commandments to some pretty epic stuff, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. But before all those extraordinary things happened, we find Moses chilling in the wilderness making excuses, He was in the wilderness making excuses, avoiding, delaying, pushing himself away from his calling. And as we read through these excuses, if you're like me, as you read them, you're going to kind of hear these excuses and think, wow, this sounds familiar. This seems a little all too similar to the excuses that I make. And my hope today is that all of us, when we read these excuses, and some of them are going to hit home to us, that, man, we would be people that would deflect those excuses and keep running and stepping towards the callings that God has given all of us, specifically in this room. But before we do, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me. So let's pray. Father, thank you for gathering us here in this space. It's, God, help us not to miss what you have for us today. We need you. God, all of us come in this room with highs and lows today, different circumstances, and so the stresses we have right now Uh, the anxieties that we have right now, God, we just give them to you right now. God, we need you. Help us through those anxieties. Help us through those stresses that we're facing in our lives. Father, control my mind, control my tongue as I speak. Thank you for the privilege it is to do it. And God, we just pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if you have a copy of the scriptures, you can open it up to the book of Exodus. That's in the Old Testament. You got the new and the old. It's the second book in. Genesis, Exodus, pretty easy to find. Or as I always will, just pop it up on the screen for you. Exodus chapter 3. But before we dive in, I, I want to share with you kind of where we were last week just to catch you up. We were talking about Moses, who was the prince of Egypt. And he was the prince of Egypt, but he was the prince that was on the run. And he was on the run because he realized that he was of Hebrew blood. And his people were being enslaved by the Egyptians. And so he was on the run because he literally murdered an Egyptian man, then buried him in the sand... Because that guy was beating a Hebrew man. And he's just had enough of it. And he's like, man, this is out of control. And so he's literally on the run, having an identity crisis, wondering, well, I'm an Egyptian, but my people that I'm of my bloodline, they're, they're Hebrews and they're enslaved and they're in horrific conditions. And so he's running, he's running, he's running, he's running, maybe away from his calling or he's trying to figure out his calling. And then we ended uh, in chapter two where it says that he sat down at the well in the camp of Midian. He sat down at the well. Now, he may have known this, or he might not have known this, but at the well back then, if you were a single dude looking to mingle and you had any brains, you'd go to the well because that's where all the ladies went. All the ladies would go to the well, chit-chat, get the water, and then they'd go back to the camp. And so Moses is hanging out at the well, you know, and as he's at the well, there's some other shepherd men hanging out at the well, looking at the girls. Well, obviously they were kind of doing something that maybe they shouldn't have been doing, so much so that Moses ran these guys off, ran them away from the well and saved these girls from whatever harm they were experiencing. And so these girls ran back to the camp and talked to their daddy, who happened to be the leader of that camp of Midian. He was the priest of that camp. And he says, who is this? The, 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 the dad's name, the priest's name was Jethro. And he says, who is this Moses? Bring him to me. 
And so Moses comes and he, and he, and he sees uh, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he says, uh, he invites them, to, he invites Moses to be a part of the community, to be a part of their, of their life, and then soon to be a part of their family because Moses ended up marrying Jethro's daughter named Zipporah. Say that with me, Zipporah. You got to have a little, like when you read that, it's like Zipporah, you know? And so he's, 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 he's like marrying Zipporah, and now he becomes a shepherd, and he's leaving his Egyptian ways, and he's just kind of living a whole new life. Meanwhile, his people, his bloodline, are still enslaved by the Egyptians, by the Pharaoh. And they're begging out to God, when are you going to rescue us? I mean, come on. And, and they're begging out to God. And so God hears their cry, and he's going to act. And he's going to act in a very, very surprising way, as he still does today. It blows my mind how he does this, isn't it? What he does is instead of just rescuing the people from the Pharaoh, what does he do? He uses an ordinary man, like Moses, to do an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And so here's where we pick up in the story in chapter 3, verse 1. You guys ready? All right, let's go. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. It continues. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when I read this, it reminded me of this amazing truth that isn't it awesome that we have a God that is constantly trying to get our attention. And he uses things like creation. He uses things like circumstance. He uses things like people to get our attention. And maybe that's you today. God has brought you here today to get your attention. And maybe this is all you need to hear. There is a God who loves you so much that is drawing after you, that is chasing after you, that is pursuing after you. He continues. He says this. Now, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, uh, God called out to him from the bush. And God said this, Moses, Moses. It's my, it's my God voice. I was practicing. What do you think? Okay. He said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And it continues. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses, I mean, right, he says that he hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, all of a sudden there's flames of fire on this bush, and then this voice comes out. Wouldn't you be hiding your face? And whenever I read this, uh, it, it takes me back to when I was a teenager when this movie came out, and it depicts it in such a way, and I always just picture this, and so I want us to just go there. I want us to just pretend we're there in the wilderness with Moses, and so take a look at this clip from the Prince of Egypt. Who are you? I am that I am. Understand. I am the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You were born of my mother, you have it. You are our brother. What do you want with me? I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry. Seeing all the blind. Did not I? 
Sucks me in every time. I just love that movie. But can we just imagine for a moment? I mean, I mean, he starts listing off all these excuses. We hear, and then, I mean, it, it's literally, okay, uh, Moses, I want you to go knock on Pharaoh's door and tell him that the Israelite nation, my free slave labor, just let him go. Free him. I mean, uh, I mean, they'd be the equivalent of, of, of God calling out to to you, you know, or calling out to me, Travis, Travis, I want you to knock on the door of North Korea and knock on Kim Jong-un's door and just say, hey, let the people free. I mean, right? He'd be like, I mean, I'm not Dennis Rodman. I mean, like, you got the wrong guy, you know? It's like, what are we doing? And so Moses begins making these excuses after excuses, five different excuses. And so we're going to look at these five excuses. And as we read them, let's let it affect uh, where it is in our own life as well. So here, here, here's the first excuse that he, that he uses. The first one is he says, well, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, he said. But here's the promise that God says back to him. He says, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. He's literally saying, well, who am I? Or in other words, why me? Like, you got the wrong person. You got the wrong guy. You, I mean, you got the wrong girl. I mean, I'm not good enough. I mean, you know my past. You know what I've done. You know what's been done to me. I mean, this isn't like, I can't, this isn't my past. I mean, why me? And, and, and some of you need to hear this today because this is the excuse that you use from the callings and the purposes that God has for, you, for your life. You think, well, why me? And, and you need to hear this. God looks past your past. God, when he looks at you, when he looks at me, you know what he sees? He sees potential. He sees potential that he wants to take your brokenness and that he wants to turn it into beauty for his purposes. And so when we get that excuse, when it rises up in us, where we're just like, man, I'm going to push away from my calling because I'm not good enough, or why me, and why me? What if, we, what if we changed our thinking and we stepped into our calling and we stood on the promise and said, instead of saying, why me, what if we added a word and just say, well, why not me? Instead of saying, well, why me? No, no, no. Step into your calling. Stand into the promise of, well, why not me? And stand into the promise when God says, I will be with you. Excuse number two. He says this. Well, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your father has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? He starts playing the what if game. You know, like, well, what if I come to the people? Sound familiar? You ever play the what if game? Well, what if this? Or what if that? The what if game, what does it do? It pushes us from our calling. Well, what if, what if that? Well, I don't know, what if, what if? And, with, and these what ifs just bury us into negativity where it keeps us and delays us from our true callings of thinking, well, I don't know enough or I'm not smart enough or, or I just, I don't really know. I don't have all the answers. And so, yeah, I'm just, I can't go into that calling. I can't go into that purpose. And then here's how God responds to Moses. He says this, I am who I am which that right there is the great title of the great creator, God, Yahweh. He literally gives him the title of all titles. I am who I am, he said. Say this to the people of Israel, that the I am has sent me to you. Reminding Moses that God is the great I am. Behind everything, behind all knowledge, he's the great I am backing you. And so when those excuses start to rise of just like, well, what if this or what if that? Don't run from the calling. Step into the calling and stand on the promises that you have the great I am backing you who is behind you 100%. Excuse number three. He says, oh, well, behold, I mean, they will not believe me or listen to my voice for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. He starts making the excuse of, well, they're not going to believe me. I mean, I, what does he do? He starts doubting. 
You ever doubt? He starts doubting himself. He starts doubting God himself and how God would use him. Man, I can be so guilty of that, of doubting myself and, and doubting how God would use the situation time and time again. And so what does God do? It continues in the, in the scriptures. We don't, we're not going to have it on the screen, but uh, if, you, if you read it later, it's, it's unbelievable. He starts to, to show off his power even more to Moses to show him different signs. So much where it says that he was holding his staff. Moses was holding his staff, and then God turned it into a serpent. And then he told him to pick up the serpent by the tail, and when he picked it up, it turned back into a staff. It's crazy. And then he said this, okay, what I want you to do, I want you to put your hands in your pockets. So he put his hands in his pockets. He said, oh, I'm going to pull your hands out of your pockets. When he pulled out his hands in his pockets, his hands were of leprosy. Then he said, put your hands back in your pockets. It's like a sick game of, uh, of Simon Says, okay? And he puts his hands back in his pockets. He's like, take him out again. No leprosy. What was he doing? He was reminding Moses of the power of God and how he will use his power when he sees fit. And just like he's reminding Moses, God is reminding you that his power, don't forget the miracles that God has done in your life. Don't forget about the miracles and the power that God has done, the big ones, the small ones. That's why it's so important to write them down. So many times I'll start to doubt myself or I'll start to doubt God and then all of a sudden he'll show off in such a big way and then it doesn't take long for me to forget that it even happened. And then I'm like freaking out again and I'm like doubting, I'm doubting. It's like, no, remember remember the miracles and so when the excuses start to come up that push you away from your calling that keeps you far from your calling what are we going to do we're not going to stay there no we're going to deflect that we're going to battle against that we're going to step into our calling and we're going to stand into the promises that our God is there and that our God will empower us will empower you as he sees fit excuse number four he says this Oh my Lord, but I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And maybe for you, it's like, I'm not this. I'm not eloquent. I'm not, what is that for you? I am not whatever weakness you feel like you have. I'm not this though. Like I'm not, I can't. This one right here has gotten me and has kept me from one of my callings for a long time. And I've talked about this before in the past as a church of me growing up with a stuttering problem and still having it. Me having to rearrange my sentences on the fly time and time again where I'll get caught on a word and I can't say what I want to say. And my friends, for so long, I allowed this excuse to keep me from one of my callings, doing what I'm doing right now. I mean, I, you would have told me five years ago that I'd be on stage talking to you people. You get, it'd be nuts. It's like you got the wrong person. You got the wrong dude. I mean, trying to have a conversation when you can't even say your name? Because if the TR is a stutter, is a hard word to say, Travis. Or I can't even say the city that I'm from, Detroit. Sometimes I can't say that, so I say, Detroit. And they're like, I don't know what's pronounced that way. I'm like, eh, me neither. You know, and we just kind of move on. You know, it's like I have to like play in that. I mean, it's like, it takes me there. But then God encouraged me. And he reminded me, and God has reminded some of you, and some of you need to be reminded or hear this for the first time, that God wants to take your weakness and make it a strength. God wants to use your weakness, and he wants to turn it into a strength, and he will use his strength. Uh, Paul tells us this, he reminds us of this amazing truth, that my power, God's power, works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me and in me. Instead of waving our weakness in the air to God and say, well, see, God, I'm, I'm this. You got the wrong person. I'm this. I'm like, no, no, no. Instead of waving that weakness, what do we do? Instead of using your, instead of using your weakness as an excuse, we give it to God for him to use. Instead of using your weakness as an excuse, give it to God. Offer it to God. Offer that weakness for him to use. Let him display his power, his strength through your weakness. It's an incredible thing that he does. Here's how he responds to Moses, to this excuse. He says, remember, like, who gave the human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you. I will help you. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Don't allow your weakness to keep you from your calling. Don't allow that excuse to make you avoid the calling and the purpose that God has for you. 
When those things come up, what are we going to do? We're going to step into our callings. And we're going to allow God, we're going to stand in his promise and let him use our weaknesses for his glory and show off his strength. And we will remember that he is a God that will help us, that he is our helper. Last excuse. Man, Moses has got a lot of excuses, right? What's up with this guy? But come on. Doesn't it sound familiar? How many excuses do I give God over and over and over and over again? The great patience that God has with me. With all the excuses that I make time and time again to avoid or push away from the callings in my life. Here's the last one. He says this. Send someone else. Just, can we just send someone else that's more qualified, please? I mean, there's someone better. Which, by the way, there always will be someone better. At whatever it is, there will always be someone better. So that's not a good enough excuse. Send someone else. And what do we do? We play the comparison game. And the comparison game is a very dangerous, sneaky little trap. Why? Because the comparison game allows you and me to just lay back in obscurity, lay back in safety, and just kind of coast, sit on the bench while everyone else is kind of doing and doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you're just like, well, there's someone else. It's so dangerous and it can keep us from our callings or never even step into the callings that we're supposed to do. Because of the comparison game, we'll send someone else or someone better. Listen, God wants to use you, specifically you. There's only one you. And we have to embrace that. And so when we think we'll send someone else, not me, we have to embrace that. Listen, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. I love that phrase. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. And God's never going to give you an assignment that you can just pull off on your own. And and so when you start to feel inadequate, like that's normal. Because he wants to give you an assignment where you have to lean into him to watch him pull it off. But he wants to use you and he wants you to be a part of it. And so I don't know what that is, but for some of you, you're sitting on the bench. You are. There's a nudge, there's a calling, there's a purpose. And maybe it's like you know you're not being the husband you're supposed to be. You know you're not being the parent you're supposed to be. You you, you know you're not doing that thing you know you're supposed to be doing with your mind or with your hands. Or maybe you know you're not building the kingdom like you're supposed to. Maybe it's even jumping on and helping build this place and and serve on one of the crews with kids or students or, or, or all of our teams that we have here or being a leader to help lead. I mean, whatever it is, you're just kind of sitting on the bench and not getting in the game and it's just... God's just crying out to you right now. Just stop making the excuses. No more excuses. Stop using excuses to push you away from the calling that God has from you. Instead, step into your calling and stand up on the the promises that God wants to use you. Now, all of these excuses that we have all stem from what? This little word that we like to call insecurities, right? And we all have our insecurities, don't we? We all have them. The loudest person in the room sometimes has the most insecurity. We all have it, and it just kind of creeps its ugly head in different ways in our lives. And so all these excuses, let's put them up. All these excuses come from our insecurities. And where does the insecurity come from? From God? No. It's from the enemy. And so remember, you're going to hear these whispers constantly in your head, these insecurities that are from the enemy that will say like, hey, who do you think you are? You're not good enough. I mean, what about this? Or what about that? Or come on, you know that can't happen. You know God's not going to show up. That vision's way too big. Or come on, weakness. You know that thing. You know you don't have, you can't do that. Send someone else, there'll be someone better. Hey, Travis, the, there's a better leader that can lead Miles City. Come on, what are you doing? Just the whispers over and over again. Some of you know you feel it. You know the excuses, the insecurities that you face. And so what do we do? The enemy wants to bury us in those insecurities, those excuses over and over again. And so what are we going to do? We're going to be people that are going to deflect those. And we're going to step into our calling. And as we step into our calling, we're going to stand on the promises of God. And we're going to stand secure, not insecure. We're going to be people that are going to stand secure and not insecure. Because what are we standing on? We stand on God. 
whose kingdom cannot be shaken, who is steady, who does not shift, whose kingdom will last forever. He is the rock that we can stand on. It's not sinking sand. We can stand on it. And so here, here's, here's the promises. We have to remember. So when, when all these excuses come up, because they're going to come up, they're going to keep coming up, when they start making sentences in our heads and we start moving away from our calling, we step into our calling. We stand into the promises. You stand up under the promises that God is with you, that God will inform you, that God will empower you, that God will help you, that God will use you. And as you embrace that, what are you doing? You're understanding your identity of who you are and what you should do and what your worth is. And so, may we be people to stop making excuses to stop pushing away from the purpose and callings that God keeps nudging us to do. Get off the bench. Step into your calling and stand in and on the promises of our God. Let me pray for us. As we close, with every head bowed and every eye closed, for some of you in this room, when you think about what you're standing on, if you're honest, it's shaky. It's sinking. And you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and it's just like, when it comes to your life and God, it's just so disconnected. And the idea of standing on solid ground, on his promises, you want that, but you've never given your life to God to say, okay, this is what I'm gonna stand for. This is what I'm gonna stand on. And I just want to let you know, God has given a way for that to happen. And that's through 2,000 years ago, giving his, his one and only son, Jesus. And he came on this earth. Why did he come on this earth? Jesus came here to solve a big problem. And that's a problem that we all face. And that's a sin problem. We all have it. We all have a disobedient problem where we've rejected God in some shape or form. And so that's a big problem. And so that's why Jesus came, to solve the problem. That's why he died on a cross to pay for our sin problem once and for all because we can't do it on our own. And then he conquered it by rising from the dead three days later. So much proof that it happened. And so the scriptures tell us that if we want to give our lives to Jesus, if we want to stand on solid ground to give ourselves real purpose and real calling for our lives, that we just have to believe and give our lives to Jesus. We call upon the name of the Lord to be saved from ourselves, to be saved from our sins. And so maybe that's you, if you're honest. It's like, it's time. It's time. You don't mess around anymore. It's time to stand on the promises of God for your life. So I want to give you that opportunity right now. And so in the quietness of this moment, if, if, if that's you, and you're like, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I need to do. It's time. No more messing around. I want to lead you through a conversation, a real conversation between you and God. Make it your own. But here's a little template that can help guide you. Just in the quietness of your heart, just say, God, here I am. I'm done living my life on shaky ground. Tell him that. I want to give my life to you. And so right now, I just want to let you know that I believe. Tell him that. I believe. And then say this. Say, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising again for me. Right now, I make you, Jesus, the king of my life. Now, as we continue to pray, if you truly meant that, if you, if you truly meant that, the scriptures tell us, I mean, that you'll no longer perish now, but now you'll have everlasting life for eternity. And not only that, that your true purpose and calling begins now. It begins now. Father, thank you for being a God that draws us close to you. Thank you for being a God that loves us so much to get our attention. <laughs> You're so good. God, give each of us the strength. When the insecurities rise, when the excuses come to the surface, God, and Instead of leaning into those excuses, 
running to those insecurities, God, that we would run to the callings you've given us and we would stand secure on your promises that you're with us, that you inform us, that you empower us, that you use us. We love you, God. We pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, can we give it up for those who put their faith in Jesus today for the first time? Thank you for joining us at Mile City Online, where our vision is helping people move towards God. Maybe today you made a specific move towards God, and we would love to help you along in that journey. Text the word Faith Move, all one word, to 77453. And one of our team members would love to have a conversation with you to help you discover your next move towards God. And remember, when you see a mile sign, pray for the Mile City.